Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome to Finnegan's webcast, Our Patent Injunctions Back from the Dead, Considerations for Manufacturing Companies After eBay and Apple. I'm Erin Summers, and I'll be your moderator today. It's my pleasure to welcome my colleagues here in Finnegan's Washington, D.C. office, Tim McNulty and Jeff Totten. Both Tim and Jeff share a particular expertise in working with our clients in the manufacturing space before U.S. Federal District Court. Before I turn things over to our presenters, I invite everyone to participate by submitting questions. This is an interactive webinar. Just click on the red Q&A button at the lower center of the webcast interface and type your question into the Q&A window, then click Submit. The questions will be answered today during the question and answer session, which will take place at the conclusion of the presentation. You may enlarge the slide window at any time by clicking on the green enlarge window button at the top right side of the slide window. The slides will advance automatically throughout the event. If at any point you are experiencing any technical difficulties, please click on the yellow webcast help guide button in the lower center of the webcast interface. And now I will turn it over to Tim and Jeff to begin our presentation. Welcome, gentlemen. Thanks, Aaron. There are a lot of remedies that relate to patent infringement suits. Um, many are industry specific and some are more prevalent in certain industries compared to others. Um, just a, a sampling, they include exclusivity in the pharmaceutical space, exclusion orders or import bans um, in cases before the International Trade Commission, lost profits, and damages. One of the most attractive remedies available to a patent owner is an injunction, and that's what we're going to focus on today. We're going to focus and discuss the Supreme Court and Federal Circuit's guidance on what courts consider when deciding whether to grant or deny injunctions, both preliminary injunctions um, and permanent injunctions. And we'll also discuss uh, some district court cases to see how uh, the court at first instance is applying the factors and guidance from uh, the Supreme Court and the Federal Circuit. As is recognized by the courts, including the Federal Circuit, uh, the statutory right uh, granted by a patent includes the right to exclude others. Uh, this is a fundamental aspect of U.S. patents um, and a concept that may be finding its way back into the court's discussion and general case law with respect to injunctions. Um, as we'll get to in a bit, the Federal Circuit relied a lot on this particular statutory provision to support its pre-eBay general rule uh, that courts should apply and issue injunctions for infringement absent special circumstances. In part, uh, with the preceding statute, um, the patent statute also provides courts the power to grant uh, injunctions, um, as in the particular case, the relative equities may permit. Um, and an injunction, um, just to get everyone on the same page, is a court order prohibiting, in a patent case, uh, further infringement or production of the infringing product or activity. Um, this injunction is generally in contrast to monetary damages where a party um, that is found to be infringing can decide whether or not to continue to make the product um, but needing to compensate the patentee to do so, um, either as part of the past damages or a future ongoing royalty. The main uh, focus of a patent infringement suit it tends to be a permanent injunction. Um, after a successful patentee proves infringement, um, the patentee is seeking to permanently enjoin or stop the accused infringer from continuing to make the product. Um, it is a remedy which attempts to help alleviate the difficult task of compensating a patentee um, with money or damages for the losses it may occur incur because of the infringement. Um, as we'll see throughout the cases we're going to be discussing, this assessment and analysis 
takes into account the harms that a patentee suffers because of infringement that it wouldn't have experienced if there was uh, no infringement. A permanent injunction comes uh, at the end of a trial um, with a determination of infringement, and it is um, brought and either granted or denied at the request, typically, of the successful patentee. Um, a preliminary injunction um, is an equitable remedy as well that is entered usually very early in a case, uh, and it is put in place by the court, if granted, to basically maintain the status quo of the parties um, pending outcome of the full trial for infringement. Thank you for that introduction, Tim. Um, now we'll discuss the eBay decision and the Federal Circuit precedent that led to it and uh, draw some conclusions for how that's shaped practice with regard to injunctions today. As I mentioned, it's first important to understand what uh, happened before the eBay decision was decided in 2006. Before that decision, the Federal Circuit applied a general rule unique to patent disputes that said a permanent injunction will issue once infringement and validity have been adjudged. <clears throat> Thus, as Tim alluded to a little while ago, injunctions would be denied only in, quote, unusual, end quote, cases, or under what the court called exceptional circumstances or in rare instances to protect the public interest. As a result, um, once a patentee showed infringement and uh, validity of its patent claims through a trial, it was almost certain to receive an injunction. The eBay decision, decided in March 2006, represented a sea change in which the Supreme Court of the United States reminded the Federal Circuit that the same equitable principles applicable in other areas of law also applied to the Patent Act. Specifically, as we see here on slide 10, the Supreme Court said that well-established principles of equity meant that a plaintiff seeking a permanent injunction had to satisfy a four-factor test before the court could grant the equitable relief. Um, these principles are not unique to patent law. In essence, the Supreme Court told the Federal Circuit that patent law is not special. The same equitable principles apply across different areas of the law as to injunctions. You may be wondering what these four factors are. Luckily, we've replicated them here for you on slide 11. Um, the four-factor test enunciated by the Supreme Court in eBay uh, includes a showing of irreparable injury to the patent owner. Um, second, the patent owner must show that remedies at law, such as the monetary damages Tim mentioned earlier, are inadequate to compensate for the injury arising from the patent infringement. Um, the court also considers the balance of hardships between the two parties involved in the dispute, the patent owner and the defendant. It also weighs the impact of public interest, specifically whether the public interest would be disserved by issuing a permanent injunction. Um, so these four equitable standards apply in the patent realm, like they do in other areas of the law where courts are considering injunctions. <clears throat> um, preliminary injunctions have a very similar set of factors that apply to them. Um, in fact, the Federal Circuit noted in Apple, in one of the Apple v. Samsung cases, which we'll discuss in a little bit more detail later, said that the standard for a preliminary injunction is essentially the same as for a permanent injunction, except that the plaintiff must show a likelihood of success on the merits rather than actual success. In other words, because a preliminary injunction is decided early in the case, 
um, the showing of uh, the inadequacy of monetary damages does not factor into the preliminary judgment situation. Um, in eBay, there were two concurrences that accompanied the decision, which I think are important um, to discuss. The first, um, penned by Justice Roberts, um, noted that historically, many courts had issued injunctions uh, after finding infringement in patent cases. Um, he noted that this had been a trend observable since at least the early 19th century that applied to the vast majority of patent cases. Um, he urged caution that this historical perspective uh, not be lost and said, uh, quote, the discretion is not whim, end quote, meaning that the um, court should not lose sight of this historical preference for an injunction after a finding of patent infringement uh, in view of the, the reaffirmance of the four-factor test by the, the decision in eBay. The second concurrence, um, written by Justice Kennedy, uh, noted that uh, while that historical perspective was interesting, um, recent developments in the commercial space um, had shown a shift by some entities toward focuses on licensing instead of producing products. Um, Justice Kennedy's concurrence says that uh, where the patent holder does not produce and sell goods and the patented invention is only a small component of an overall larger product, uh, monetary damages may suffice in that instance. Again, that is not a uh, general rule, but we see it as a, a bit of guidance to, to courts. And uh, as we'll discuss, courts have taken that as um, some guidance as they consider on a case-by-case -case basis whether injunctive relief is proper. Um, since the eBay decision came back down in 2006, um, we've seen a change in the rate of, at which they have been instituted. Um, prior to eBay, uh, almost all cases resulting in findings of infringement and validity resulted in permanent injunctions. Um, as the commentators identified here on slide 12 have noted uh, through uh, statistical analysis, uh, that is no longer the case. Um, they concluded that in about 70% uh, of cases, injunctions are now issued. Um, they noted that others looking at this question have found a success rate of 72 to 78%. Um, this uh, statistical analysis was done in May of 2017, so these numbers are fairly recent. Um, we think it's interesting that uh, the success rate remains high, so while many reading eBay in 2006 thought that injunctions may have been a thing of the past. Um, the ensuing 12 years of practical experience show that that is not the case. They still happen in uh, more than a majority of successful infringement cases. Jeff, I'm sorry, I'd like to jump in and ask you a question about these statistics. Are they consistent across industries? That's a good question, Erin, thank you. Um, they're not. Um, some industries have uh, higher success rates than others. Um, you know, we see uh, the chemical arts and uh, consumer goods, other spaces have um, similar success rates. Um, outliers that have lower success rates include uh, software and uh, medical devices. And there may be different reasons for that in individual cases. You know, in the um, software space, for example, we could see situations where uh, inventions may represent only a small component of a larger product, or perhaps the entity involved in that suit, uh, more entities in, in that space are involved primarily in licensing, um, not bringing products to market. 
So that may speak to the issues raised in the second concurrence in eBay. Um, and I think that's borne out by some of the numbers we see. Um, you know, even in that space, however, injunctions issue in about half of uh, cases, permanent injunctions issue in about half of the cases where the patent owner has been successful through the trial. Um, so the injunction to answer the question raised at the beginning of the uh, presentation today is far from dead. Um, rather, it's uh, an ongoing issue that's considered by courts in many cases across different technical fields. Was there anything else surprising to you when you looked in detail at this data um, that you wouldn't have otherwise thought given the shift in law from eBay? Uh, yeah, there was one other thing. Um, we saw that it appears people are still asking for and receiving injunctions. Um, you know, after eBay, I think that uh, we've seen, we expected that uh, fewer patent holders would even attempt to to ask for an injunction uh, when asserting a patent. Um, the numerical analysis shows that uh, those requests seem to have been fairly steady um, numerically from from year to year. It's a little difficult to pull general trends from those because uh, some years there are very few cases, uh, some years there are many that uh, result in a win, a clear win for the patent owner where an injunction might be appropriate. Um, but looking before eBay and after eBay, we didn't see a trend down, which is what we were expecting to see. Um, quickly, I'll just touch on uh, what is happening on appeal of injunction decisions. As we see here on slide 13, um, in most cases um, where an injunction has been granted, the Federal Circuit is upholding that on appeal. Um, in almost uh, nine out of 10 cases where the district court has granted an injunction, that injunction is reviewed and upheld on appeal. Um, and in about half of the cases where an injunction has been denied, the uh, Federal Circuit has um, reversed or vacated that uh, that decision, typically vacating and remanding the decision for further consideration by the district court. We'll take a look at uh, examples of those cases um, as we go through the uh, presentation today. Thanks, Jeff. We're going to discuss a series of cases between Apple and Samsung. Um, to me, these cases combine to give another milestone relating to injunction and, and sort of the status and how the courts look at injunctions in the patent context. Um, and I think a good milestone relative to the eBay case that came some time ago. Collectively, the Apple cases set out guidance from the Federal Circuit, both on preliminary and permanent injunctions. They focus primarily on the first factor, um, which in some instances um, is often dispositive of what constitutes the irreparable harm. And the court does so in addressing a multi-component product um, that has lots of different features um, and a lot of different um, patented features. While we won't discuss all of the intricacies of the cases, we will focus on what we think the cases um, bring to sort of that milestone of um, like the eBay case in patent injunction law. Um, the cases do discuss other factors um, and we'll touch on them and we'll address uh, those a bit more with specific cases later in today's discussion. Um, but overall, the Federal Circuit, um, to me, used the Samsung Apple cases to reemphasize the idea that there is a prohibition on general rules uh, with respect to injunctions. That is, just as the Supreme Court in eBay said that uh, there is not a general rule that injunctions will automatically or should um, issue in almost every patent infringement case, uh, there are issues that come up uh, with respect to how courts address each of the factors in 
set out in eBay in the particular facts of a given case. And throughout the Apple Samsung cases, the Federal Circuit took the opportunity to point out that the overarching view from the eBay case is that general rules are not um, permitted and has taken issue with district courts that sort of generally apply some sort of bright line um, type of test uh, with respect to any of the factors um, outlined from eBay. The first case, or Apple One, um, dealt with a preliminary injunction, uh, which as Jeff mentioned, uh, includes factors that are slightly different from a permanent injunction, but includes basically the same type of analysis. Um, the main focus on the Apple One case was the Federal Circuit's view that a particular causal nexus was required um, for Apple or the patentee uh, to be able to show that there is irreparable harm and meet that first requirement of the eBay test. Apple challenged the need to actually show this nexus, but the Federal Circuit confirmed in Apple I that it was necessary. And as the court explained, it was necessary to show, uh, or for a patentee, to show irreparable harm because that patentee must show that the infringement is causing the harm in the first place. It is not just okay or enough for a patentee to show that um, a particular sale of a good is causing it harm, and, and that that harm would be irreparable. The the sale and and the activity that the accused infringer is is doing actually has to come from infringement. Um, said another way, according to the court, sales lost to an infringing product cannot irreparably harm a patentee if consumers buy that product for reasons other than the patented feature. Uh, as the court uh, dealt with the Apple One um, facts, it indicated that the irreparable harm needs to be more than something that's merely insubstantial. Um, the types of harm that can and are often used to show irreparable harm are market share loss, brand loyalty, or other impediments, um, downstream concerns, and you know, follow-on sales. Uh, and these types of harms that a patentee is raising and arguing are irreparable need to be more than something that's insubstantial. Um, in Apple II, Apple II also dealt with a preliminary injunction. Um, and here, as we'll see throughout the Apple Samsung cases, the Federal Circuit starts to clarify what it means and really what the scope of the causal nexus requirement is. Um, as explained by the court in Apple II, where the accused product includes many features of which only one or a small minority infringe, a finding that a patentee will be at risk of irreparable harm does not alone justify the injunctive relief. Again, going back to um, Jeff's point about the concurrence in eBay and some skepticism or concern of these um, multi-component products and then a patent on a small or a minor feature, um, looking to create a injunction from that um, has some skepticism and the court is requiring this causal nexus to show that that patented feature is actually important and, and relates to um, the harm that the patentee is, is, um, is, a, is feeling. As the court explained, the patentee must show that the harm is sufficiently rated, related to the infringement. This is, in a sense, what the causal nexus is, is getting at, and as the court explained, is actually part of the irreparable harm calculus. The court was quick to explain that it is not a separate or an additional uh, requirement to the eBay factors, but something that is part of and part and parcel to uh, the irreparable harm calculation. From a overall patent law perspective, this um, causal nexus with respect to injunctions uh, sounds a lot like the concern that the Federal Circuit has um, and other courts have with apportioning damages. 
Um, it is, a, again, focusing on trying to relate the value of the patent uh, to the harm and then the relief that the courts are willing to grant to the patentee. Apple III dealt with a permanent injunction. Um, so unlike the preliminary injunctions from Apple I and II, um, Apple III related and explained that the causal nexus uh, that was part for the preliminary injunction analysis is also part of the permanent injunction analysis. Um, again, as the court explained, there's no presumption of irreparable harm upon finding of infringement. The causal nexus requirement applies as part of a showing of irreparable harm uh, for a permanent injunction, just as for a preliminary injunction. Uh, the court went on to explain that reasoning in Apple I and II reflects general tort principles of causation and applies equally, again, to preliminary and permanent injunctions. Here, Apple uh, had challenged whether or not the causal nexus uh, that the court found was required for preliminary injunctions also applied to the permanent injunction scenario, and the court said it did. Uh, the court also reemphasized its holding from Apple II, noting that, again, irreparable harm includes the causal nexus analysis. And while they may be separated for the ease of analysis, they are related uh, concepts. The court did note as well that in cases that involve relatively straightforward products um, that are not multi-component products, uh, the impact or causal nexus between the infringing feature and the demand for the product may not be in dispute. And the court noted some of its earlier uh, injunction cases that dealt with some um, more straightforward, not so multifaceted products, uh, like wiper blades in the Bosch case, uh, orthopedic nails, and broadband capacitors in several other cases. But the court explained that these principles do not mean that a patentee must show that the patent feature is the one and only reason for the demand, and explained that the showing merely requires that the patented feature drives or provides some connection between the patented feature and the demand for the particular product. Uh, one other aspect that I think is interesting from the Apple III decision is that the court said that it was okay to aggregate patents together, um, that multiple patents may combine to provide and protect a particular particular innovative feature, and that it's okay to use those aggregated together to show that that infringement of those does drive in itself, again in the aggregate, the alleged irreparable harm. And finally, the Apple IV case um, went on to explain, again, reemphasize that the causal nexus must be shown regardless of the scope of the injunction. Here, Apple attempted to, sh to sort of lessen the requirement for causal nexus um, because the injunction would have been limited to something uh, much more specific, not the overall smartphone, but just a particular feature. The court noted that while the scope of the injunction is important, it relates more to other factors from eBay, like balancing the hardships and the public interest. It is not a specific um, component of determining whether or not the alleged harm uh, that is alleged is actually caused by the specific infringement. The court explained that while it does have to be a feature that drives or is important for the demand of the good, that the infringing feature does not need to be the exclusive or the only reason, um, but it does have to be, at least in some ways, a reason that drives the demand for <clears throat> the given product. Tim, do you think the Apple versus Samsung cases set the outer edge for likelihood of injunctions for multi-component manufactured products? Well, I think to me it provides guidance on what constitutes irreparable harm. And I 
it's it's clear that the the court did look at it from the perspective that it it was looking at a multi component product um and probably something that again as Jeff mentioned goes back to the second concurrence in eBay um and the overall concern that a particular small element or minor feature might give a patentee undue leverage. Um, throughout the Apple cases, the Federal Circuit outlined how the alleged irreparable harm must be linked to the infringing activity, and that's the court's causal nexus requirement, and gave general guidelines. Um, again, no specific rule is a bright line rule or dispositive, but gave some indications as to how district courts should look um, and how patentees should attempt to show the causal link between what is covered by the patent and what infringing activity versus how that drives demand for a particular good. Uh, throughout the cases, the Apple cases, the court also notes that this is very market specific and product specific, and in some instances, um, the causal nexus may be very apparent. In others, it may take more of a showing, depending on level of complexity of the good. Um, and it also may be different because the, pers the, the different perspectives of the buyers or the given market um, may have different motivations. And it's more of a, I think, general outline for how to go about um, seeking uh, injunctions, both preliminary injunctions and permanent injunctions. Thank you, Tim. Uh, next, we'd like to discuss a case that came out last year, GenBand v. Metaswitch Networks Corporation. This is a federal circuit case decided in July of 2017 that uh, is notable for its analysis and explanation of the Apple Samsung cases and how the four different decisions Tim just outlined kind of weave together um, and how district courts and parties can think about applying the various uh, factors um, to show ir irreparable harm and the need for an injunction. Um, GenBand is a very good case to read because it goes through the four Apple decisions and tries to explain how they work together. It um, explains that Apple One uh, shows patented features with only an insubstantial connection to the purported irreparable harm um, are not sufficient to justify an injunction. Um, it then looks at some of the language found in Apple IV, which confirms that uh, there's not a requirement that the patented feature be the exclusive or predominant reason for the alleged irreparable harm. Um, the answer for how much of a nexus is necessary lies somewhere in the middle. Um, the court emphasized language from Apple III and Apple IV saying that there must be some connection between the patented feature and the harm. But to one reading uh, Apple I alone, that uh, some connection language can get a little lost, um, even though it's there. So in some ways, GenBand um, explains the prior decisions and I think gives many patent holders uh, a little bit more hope that injunctive relief may be on offer for them, at least from an irreparable harm standpoint. We'll talk a little bit about the facts in GenBand and not just its uh, legal holding, which is summarized here, um, but this is probably why the case is, is most notable and useful to those of us in the practice. GenBand was a case as summarized here on slide 22 between competing manufacturers. Um, these two companies were involved in selling products and services in the voice over IP uh, space. So it's a telecommunications company selling both services and um, hardware. Uh, the suit was brought in the Eastern District of Texas even though uh, both companies were manufacturers um, one is not solely a licensing entity. 
Um, the court had denied a permanent injunction because the patentee had not shown irreparable harm. Specifically, the court found, the district court found that the evidence presented by the patentee did not show that the patented features drove the sales of the product. And this um, looking for what drives the sales of the accused product is the language that the Federal Circuit uh, focused on in its decision. Um, specifically, the Federal Circuit noted that Nexus requires just some connection between irreparable harm and infringing acts. Um, specifically, the patented feature need only be a driver of demand for the infringing product. It does not need to be the driver of demand. So uh, while the patented feature must be important to the customers or consumers who receive the product, it does not have to be the sole reason or even the uh, leading factor one could argue, in uh, the purchase decision by those customers or consumers. The uh, court noted um, that a caveat that this applied at least in a multi-purchaser, multi-component situation uh, relating to a component of a larger product or system that gives it some room in future cases to uh, raise potential distinctions. Um, but uh, that uh, was the, the focus of the Federal Circuit's um, reversal. The evidence that had been presented below um, included uh, internal reports from GenBand and um, demonstratives trying to correlate press releases with declines in market share and um, statements from marketing materials from the uh, accused products. Um, so this evidence, uh, the district court found, didn't show that the patented feature was a was the driver of the um, accused product, and the Federal Circuit found that analysis wanting. Um, interestingly, uh, below the district court had also noted that Gen Bond had delayed in bringing its suit and had decided not to bring a preliminary injunction. That was the second reason the district court gave for denying the injunction in the first instance. Um, the Federal Circuit um, noted that this could uh, weigh into the analysis, but didn't um, otherwise uh, use this as a, a sufficient reason to uphold the decision not to to issue the injunction. So while those factors may be relevant in this case, they weren't uh, dispositive. Thanks, Jeff. Um, we're gonna talk about another case, Metalcraft v. Toro, and somewhat shift a little bit from the causal nexus that we've been discussing quite a bit about. Um, we're we're going to talk, at least with Metalcraft, about the irreparable harm, but start to focus and point out some other um, aspects of the four factors that the court um, is taking a look at and how they're deciding uh, the particular cases on, on the facts. The Metalcraft Toro case is a case relating to lawnmowers. Both companies are competing manufacturers, and the uh, patented technology related to the suspension for the operator seat um, relative to a rigid chassis uh, so that the vibrations and bumps um, that the chassis may experience as it's uh, going over the ground are not transferred to the operator. Focus here uh, is on a preliminary injunction that was sought and was granted and upheld on appeal. The evidence uh, that Metalcraft put on to show that it, the preliminary injunction was warranted uh, 
focused on its competition with Toro on initial customers and those customers buying the initial lawnmowers with the patented feature and that those initial customers were then becoming lifelong customers and the initial sale affected Metal Craft's overall ecosystem for its line of business. The point that Metal Craft was making was that once a customer buys the first uh, mower, a uh, commercial mower, uh, with the patented feature, that that customer then becomes brand loyal and the downstream effects on the ecosystem um, are irreparable because they are practically impossible to assess. And the district court agreed. The district court accepted and explained that it is impossible to quantify those damages uh, with losing that first sale, although that may be quantifiable the effects on the overall ecosystem is not. The, uh, the main issue did not focus on was there a causal nexus between the, in, uh, the infringing activity or the alleged infringing activity and the patent. It was mostly on the alleged irreparable harm and whether or not that raised to a level that uh, warranted the preliminary injunction. The district court agreed with Metalcraft that it did, and the Federal Circuit um, upheld. Again, the review standard is um, an abuse of discretion, and the initial grant of the equitable relief of the injunction, uh, both preliminary and permanent, is uh, and rests within the court's uh, equitable discretion. The court um, also addressed the fact that um, an argument that Toro made against the inf uh, injunction was that there were many other infringers in the market. And the court said that just because there are other infringers did not weigh against having an injunction against Toro, one of, um, based on the facts, uh, 10 to 12 different competing uh, companies in the same space with the same types of products. The, the courts noted that the balance of equities did not weigh in favor of Toro in this particular case, um, and actually weighed in favor of Metalcraft because Metalcraft would have to um, effectively compete against its own patent invention uh, when it otherwise would not have to. Um, and there was no um, public interest or there was no public interest against the injunction um, because the public was not going to be denied the effect patented feature uh, with the, the improved suspension system or if they wanted other non-infringing types of, of mowers, um, those were still available. And briefly, we're going to discuss another case uh, WBIP v. Kohler. These uh, parties uh, competed in a low carbon exhaust system for marine generators, typically used on houseboats, and the patented feature related to um, dispersing exhaust fumes that would otherwise accumulate um, in areas and be harmful to uh, the people who were um, in the confined space of a of a houseboat. This case is interesting um, for a couple of reasons. Uh, it went uh, through a jury decision, all claims infringed and not invalid, but a permanent injunction was denied. The denial was actually vacated and remanded uh, on appeal. The district court decision um, was based a lot on the fourth factor from eBay, uh, the public interest. And the district court focused on the life-saving good in the market and focused and in, that this was in the public's interest and that weighed against the injunction. 
uh, when the case was on appeal, the Federal Circuit explained that while this reasoning may be true, it's true in nearly every situation that involves these types of beneficial type of goods or products. And again, the court emphasized that the categorical rules uh, for injunctions are disfavored. So again, unlike some of the early cases we discussed, like Apple and Genban, uh, these last two cases uh, do focus on other factors, not um, the causal nexus that is a key requirement, um, but focusing on the different types of irreparable harm that may be shown and looking at the other types of uh, analyses with respect to the other factors that both district courts and the federal circuit are looking at and addressing. Tim, having looked at these cases, how does the weight of the factors change, if at all, depending on the, the particular industry? I think that's a good question, um, and I think we've seen each factor sort of playing out um, differently for different markets and different products. Um, I think the court, with its causal nexus requirement, is looking at multifaceted products, and I think in direct competitive markets, they're looking at hardships between the parties, and I think in those cases, sort of that WBIP and Kohler highlight where there is a public interest, uh, those those courts are looking more at those other factors than perhaps, um, you know, in a consumer good and where it's just a matter of preference, um, but that preference does drive personal interest and demand. They, the courts are looking and in a sense, I think it's safe to say weighing some of those uh, factors differently because they're more pertinent to certain industries and markets than um, perhaps others. Tim, before we move on, I had one other question for you about those two Federal Circuit cases. Um, the Federal Circuit looks at uh, the decision to grant or not grant an injunction, either permanent or preliminary, uh, on an abuse of discretion standard. Um, how does that factor in when it's looking at how the court below has weighed the um, aspects of the uh, fact, the eBay factors? I think the court looks at it from a perspective that has the district court gone through uh, a, a decent analysis on each of those factors and of, has the district court um, actually weighed the evidence and assessed it and not used, as the court has emphasized, I think, regularly, um, has whether the district court um, has used some sort of general assessment, um, a categorical uh, grant or denial um, across uh, any of the factors with respect to the Kohler case, just because there is a public interest and a, a benefit from uh, the improved uh, generators with improved exhaust dispersion, uh, doesn't automatically mean that an injunction cannot follow. Um, similarly, if there is a balance of hardships or, or other um, one of the other factors, I think the court is, is making sure that a good analysis was done at the district court level um, and, and really trying to avoid some sort of generality or a all or nothing type situation. Thank you. Um, we'll briefly touch on some recent district court decisions um, before taking additional questions from our audience um, that we haven't been able to work in during the presentation so far. Um, these are identified here on slide 31. These are not all of the recent decisions between manufacturers. They're just um, a selection of cases that uh, both grant and deny uh, injunctions and, and highlight some aspects of how courts are weighing the factors. The first, um, Para versus Mojack distributors related to uh, hunting products, specifically devices that generated ozone for masking the scent of uh, hunters in the field. Um, as one can guess, this was a rather small market, um, only 
two competitors uh, known to make devices in the market, according to the evidence before the trial court. Um, these were the two parties in the case. Um, so this head-to-head -head competition weighed into uh, the balance of harm between the two parties. You know, the court noted that uh, losing customers from the patent holder to the um, accused infringer would impact uh, the, um, the patent holder, both losing a potential lifelong customer as well as the immediate sale. Um, there was also concern expressed about price erosion due to the head-to-head -head competition between the two. So that, that factored large in this particular case on these facts in the decision to grant a preliminary injunction. Again, the court felt like um, to preserve the status quo, that injunction was necessary. Jeff, in this particular situation, uh, is there any interest that the court considers when there's only two competitors in this space? Yeah, yes, uh, Aaron. I think the um, court may be more willing to consider evidence that uh, one of the parties is considered an innovator in the space where there's a uh, head to head, and also those concerns about um, price erosion as well as um, the loss of customers uh, also may loom larger where there is a direct head to head competition without others in the marketplace. You know, if you and I are the only competitors in the market and I lose a customer to you, that may have more harm on me um, than uh, in some other industries. Another case uh, that I think is worth talking about is the Edgeworks manufacturing case. Um, this relates to competing manufacturers with respect to ammunition magazine. Um, again, a head-to-head -head type of competitor base and litigation. The district court ended up denying a preliminary injunction, effectively finding no irreparable harm. What is interesting uh, for this particular case is the evidence and the evidentiary showing um, that the district court found was missing um, and missing um, significantly uh, with respect to the showing of the irreparable harm. Uh, again, considering that it was a preliminary injunction, typically very early in the case, uh, not a lot of discovery has occurred. So sometimes the evidence uh, that's available to show irreparable harm, again, showing the causal nexus um, that the infringing activity or the alleged infringing activity is driving the, de the demand and then driving the harm, uh, may not be uh, so ready, um, but merely making allegations um, and making affidavit statements without underlying supporting evidence, data, some sort of real tangible evidence is not going to be enough. It's not enough in a way to just suggest or allege that because there are head-to-head -head competition um, and there's a patentee that is viewed as an innovator that because there is alleged infringing activity that irreparable harm is assumed. The Again, it goes back to the point that um, the Federal Circuit has emphasized that the generalities or the general rules are not um, appropriate in determining injunctions and district courts are then looking hard at the evidence to make sure that the allegations and that harm is linked to something tangible. The one takeaway though from a lot of these cases, but perhaps uh, worth mentioning for Edgeworks, is that the irreparable harm that is often alleged both for preliminary and permanent injunctions does relate to loss of goodwill or damage to reputation, um, as Jeff mentioned with PARA, um, the reputation as an invader may be harmed, um, lost business opportunities, all applicable depending on the, the particular nature of the, the market and, and the competitors. <laughs> 
Thanks, Tim. I think it's a good reminder that uh, you want supporting evidence, documentary evidence underneath the affidavits that you're putting in in support of a preliminary injunction uh, if that information is available. That seemed to be among the things that the court found lacking in Edgeworks. The next case, Sure v. Clear One, um, is a case where a preliminary injunction was denied, but not due to a lack of irreparable harm. Um, that case uh, highlights that the likelihood of success on the merits can, in some instances, be a high bar to overcome. Um, in essence, the preliminary injunction asks the uh, patentee to prove its entire case at the outset, and uh, here, sure, uh, fell short of that mark. Um, not being able to show a likelihood of prevailing on an invalidity challenge and um, losing the preliminary injunction as a result. Um, in that case, the irreparable harm analysis is interesting because it does illustrate uh, what a party can use to bulwark the evidence it's putting in to the uh, district court, um, the type of documents that can support a uh, argument of irreparable harm. And thanks, Jeff. And just to touch before we jump to questions, just to touch on one last case, the Chamberlain Group v. Tektronik. Um, to me, this case is interesting um, because it raises sort of another facet to the injunction analysis um, between uh, competitors, uh, but competitors that are of vastly different size in the market. Um, Chamberlain, a relatively smaller compared to Tektronik um, producer of garage doors, uh, brought a suit and sought a permanent injunction um, against Tektronik. And this case is an opportunity to highlight, one, the disparity between the parties and how that may, um, in some instances and or may not, be a, an aspect that the district court considers and also how that relates to balancing of the hardships between the parties. Um, usually in these cases, there's always arguments on, on both sides, and it is really an equitable analysis as far as how the courts are going to weigh um, the relative pros and cons, the hardship for the patentee versus the hardship for the accused infringer. The, the one interesting part, uh, just to touch briefly for this case, is Two things as far as the hardship and the balance. One, the defendant um, did have stock that it wanted to basically sell out and effectively pay damages for. Um, that did not sway the court. Uh, one, because uh, the patentee had enough capacity to meet the market demand. Um, and on the balance of the hardships, the court noted that while Tektronik maintained a very robust, huge, multi-billion dollar business well beyond just garage doors, um, the openers and the innovative patented features uh, were a core of Chamberlain's business and finding that that was a factor that weighed in favor of the injunction when it was balancing the hardships on the respective companies. Let's let's move on to questions now, but before we do so, I'd just like to remind our audience to please take a moment to complete our brief evaluation survey. Uh, we strive to provide programs of real value to our audience members and to, to continually improve them. So as a result, we would appreciate your input, um, which will certainly help us gui help guide us in planning future programs. Now I'd like to uh, take a few questions from the audience and uh, Jeff, you had touched on some statistics before. One of our audience members is curious and would really like to know the success rate for permanent injunctions in the medical device space. Um, thank you, Erin. As I, as I mentioned when we were talking about the uh, post-eBay success rates, um, medical devices and software are kind of outliers with lower success rates than what we see across other industries. Um, in the medical device space, uh, permanent injunctions issue in about half, perhaps a little bit less than half of uh, cases. 
based on the statistics in the article we um, we cited, and we see that just empirically uh, and anecdotally in the cases that we we analyze and participate in, that um, in that space it can, in some instances, be uh, more difficult to, for a successful patentee to get a permanent injunction. Okay, that's great. And I'd like to ask uh, Tim one additional question, if I could. What is the mechanism for appealing a district court's decision on a preliminary injunction? Thanks, Aaron. Um, there is a statutory provision that provides interlocutory appeals um, from a grant of a preliminary injunction. So this statutory provision falls within the regular judiciary um, appellate type um, statutes, and in particular for patent cases, uh, those uh, interlocutory orders, uh, which preliminary injunctions are specifically called out, go to the federal circuit. Um, and that order um, from the district court can be anything related to the preliminary injunction. Uh, the granting, continuing, modifying, refusing, um, or modifying or changing, dissolving that preliminary injunction as it may go during the case. So um, it's a statutory appeal, and that can go forward before the remainder of the case. One thing to note is that in some instances, the district court may stay the uh, grant or denial of the preliminary injunction, uh, depending on uh, while the case goes to appeal if um, the adverse party decides to uh, challenge that, that grant or denial. Thank you, Tim. Uh, on behalf of both Tim and Jeff and myself, I'd like to thank you for attending today's webcast, Our Patent Injunctions Back from the Dead. As Tim and Jeff conveyed, I think the question is they certainly might, or the answer is they certainly might be. Uh, this presentation will be available on demand in the next week. Please look for an email from us with uh, the access link. This concludes today's Finnegan webcast. Thank you for participating.